Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in response to uh, uh, the budget. When I first saw the budget in, uh, on, on last Thursday, um, I, I was literally speechless. And those of you who know me know that is a rare, that's a rare thing. Um, but I, I, I was a little like now, absolutely gobsmacked by the scale and frequency of deficits. I understand we're in a very difficult financial position, but a $10.4 billion deficit this year, a $10.1 billion deficit next year, an $8 billion deficit the year after that, and on and on and on and on with absolutely no plan beyond crossing your fingers and hoping perhaps oil revenues go up or something magical happens to eventually find our way back to balance. It's, it's beyond troubling. Um, and, and while some may be angry about this, my instinct was, was concern, was worry for the future, worry for our viability, for worry for what happens, what happens if we're wrong, what happens if it gets worse, what happens if we end up with just, just a few years from now, $50 billion in debt and continued declines in oil prices, continued economic challenges for our province. What then? What happens then? As I said earlier today, it feels like it's the, the person who moved out of the house for the first time and doesn't realize you need to pay back the visa bill. But the visa bill always comes due and interest always accrues. And we've got a government that has no ability to manage their debt load, no willingness or ability to manage debt costs because our credit rating downgrade, a direct result, of the complete lack of a plan to come anywhere close to balance and the ab abdication of any plan to cap debt costs at a reasonable level. The plan for the 15% debt to GDP ratio lasted less than six months. Now, this year, we're going to have a debt to GDP ratio in excess of 9%, next year in excess of 13, the year after that in excess of 15. And, and where does it go from there? Well, we only have three years of forecasts. I can't even begin to imagine how high that gets. So that takes Alberta out of being the lowest, uh, the, having the best balance sheet in Canada by having the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the country. Our friends in Saskatchewan, under Premier Brad Wall, have that distinction, and good for them. So they're in a far stronger financial position than Alberta finds ourselves in as a direct result of the choices this government makes. Of course you don't control the price of oil, of course not. This government does control your response to that. Now. There are some things I do like about the budget, and I think they're worth mentioning. It's always nice when you see some of your own ideas and some of your own party's policies implemented in a budget. And the small business tax cut and investor tax credit are two core Alberta party policies. So it's good to see those happening. I think they're good for Alberta, and I congratulate the government for putting those in. The increase to post-secondary education funding, I think, is, is, a, is a good idea. Uh, a nod to mental health funding, although I don't think it's sufficient. It's a start down that path. Funding enrollment growth for uh, K-12, to I think, is, is a good move. Continued investment for infrastructure, and this is where I think responsible borrowing has a part to play. I think it's okay to borrow money for infrastructure, because we have an asset at the end of the day. You need to have a plan to pay it back. If you're borrowing for operations, as this government is doing, and not just a little bit, borrowing just to keep the lights on, borrowing for pens and pencils, for office furniture, just to operate the government, and you're doing that at massive levels with no plan to even not borrow for operations in the foreseeable future, we put ourselves in a big hole. Uh, I believe the funding for uh, affordable uh, housing uh, and seniors' housing that's absolutely welcome as well, long overdue and uh, necessary as part of that infrastructure investment. But on the whole, I feel this government is on the wrong track, that they're setting Alberta up to fail, setting us up for even more difficult choices in the future, either significant public sector cuts or big tax increases or potentially both. It's a huge risk, and I don't want this government to fail. I do not want the ND government to fail. I really don't. Because if this government fails, Alberta fails. That's not good. That's not what I'm here for. That's not what I'm cheering for. 
But I really worry that if you stay on this path, that you will fail, and Alberta's not going to be as well off. And that's all Albertans, including vulnerable Albertans, not business owners, not only business owners, not only those who have lost their jobs, but vulnerable Albertans. Where does the money come from to pay for important services to support vulnerable Albertans? It's an important question that I really urge this government to ask themselves. Where does the money come from? How does that happen? You keep plucking the golden goose eventually. Eventually that's not going to happen. Eventually it's going to be gone. But there are options. There are options and choices between massive cuts and between massive deficits. There is a middle way. There is a better way of doing this, which, my friends, is why we have pr proposed and presented our second shadow budget, which I'm going to talk about now. Our, the Alberta Party shadow budget, which I would, would, would hasten to add we're the only opposition party in this assembly to present a shadow budget, because I think it's important. I think it's important that those of us on this side remember that our job is not just to oppose the government. Our job is to propose ideas. Our friends in the PC caucus have their engaged document. It's a good document. There's lots of really interesting ideas in there. Don't agree with all of it. But there's a lot of interesting ideas and they've continued the conversation. That's a good thing. Our friends in Wild Rose have some bullet points, general ideas of kind of vague things they might do. But I would challenge, I would challenge the official opposition to put some numbers to that. That's important. That is important. We're talking about the budget. Albertans need to know how would we on this side of the House, how would we as opposition solve these problems? And they need to know in detail. And that's what the Alberta Party shadow budget does. Our shadow budget balances in four years. We accommodate population growth and preserve frontline services. We use more conservative revenue forecasts than the government, especially on non-renewable resource revenues. In two years from now, this budget, budget 2016, assumes that oil will be $64 a barrel. The, the dollar will be 78, 74 cents. And of course, as we know, the lower the dollar, the more money we return. Ours, on the other hand, assumes that in two years' time, oil will only be $56 a barrel, and that the dollar will be around 78 cents. Again, more conservative revenue forecasts. That's how, and, and yet, we're still able to balance in four years and accommodate population growth, not decimate frontline services. And we do that by freezing public sector salaries. That seems only fair. At a time when our neighbours are losing their jobs, or they're being asked to take salary rollbacks or reduced work hours, that we ask the, 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 the tremendous public servants in the province of Alberta to get paid the same next year as they got paid last year. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. And that's going to help us get a long way towards uh, towards some, some sanity in this budget. And we need to engage public servants in a genuine way, most particularly in the health care system. There are tremendous people in this province, many countless hundreds of whom I've talked with, who have great ideas in how we can manage costs and improve service delivery, truly, truly do more for less. But they're not listened to. There is a toxic culture within Alberta Health Services. It is a huge challenge to be overcome. This government needs to commit to that, not nibble around the edges, but make real true change, real culture change within the public service, and truly genuinely listen to the great people who provide those services every single day. And yes, that means frontline direct service providers who interact with Albertans, but it also means management. There are a lot of tremendous people in the management layers of Alberta Health Services in particular, but also all throughout the public service. We need to empower those people. We need to take smart risk within the public service. We need to create a free market for good ideas within Alberta's public service. Anytime we hear, well, we don't do it like that around here because we just don't. Wrong answer. Why do we do it that way? Can't we do it better? Challenge ourselves, challenge our public servants to continually improve. That's how we're going to find more for less. That's how we're going to steward Albertans' tax dollars and ensure that Albertans get the services they deserve at a reasonable cost. Coupled with a priority-based budgeting exercise to ensure highest priority projects are completed first. This is going to result in bringing per capita spending in line with the national average within three years. That's a reasonable target. That's a reasonable plan that will not result in massive public service cuts, 
but will also ensure that we are not burdened with unsustainable levels of debt down the road. And if we make Alberta's carbon tax revenue neutral, ultimately work towards making it revenue neutral by cutting personal tax, by cutting small business tax, by cutting the large corporate tax rate, just 1%, and using the proceeds of the carbon tax. What we do is we create a frame for innovation. We have a disincentive for what we don't want. We don't want carbon emissions. Let's create, make it more expensive for people to burn carbon. That's the purpose of a carbon tax, so people burn less of it. And people and individuals innovate and find ways of doing less. That's a good idea. That's what a carbon tax should be. But let's reward people for the things we do want. We want an attractive investment climate in this province. We want people to keep more of their hard-earned money, the money through the, they've earned through their honest efforts. So let's cut personal and business tax and offset that with the carbon tax. That's not what I've heard from this government, and I have a tremendous problem with that. So there are opportunities. There are choices. There are choices, and there is a middle way and a better way than massive public service cuts, than massive unsustainable debt and deficits. That's what the Alberta Party stands for, and that's why I have a big challenge with this budget. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Questions or comments under 29-2A? The Honourable Member for uh, Calgary Northwest. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'd be interested uh, to hear, in light of your comments about uh, 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 wage freezes and that sort of thing, uh, uh, if you could touch a little bit more on the reduction of our AAA credit rating and uh, how you see that as a priority for you and how you see us tackling that problem. Thank you. That's a great question. And I think that if we were to go to credit rating agencies with a credible plan to get back to balance sometime before a vague 2024, that's what they asked for. The debt to GDP ratio of 15% is one of many uh, 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 factors that they consider. It's an important one, but it's not the only one. What they see is a government that's profligate, that just seems to think that money is absolutely uh, infinite. Um, and, and there's, uh, there's, there's uh, um, uh, you know, in terms of the impact, you asked about the impact. I've asked repeatedly in this House whether the Minister of Finance has done the calculation for what the impact of a potential credit rating downgrade is. Now, I suspect that somewhere in Treasury Board and Finance that, that exists, but the Minister, for whatever reason, has chosen not to share that with us. If he hasn't done that work, that's, that's troubling. Um, even, even a few basis points, even a few hundredths of a percent, multiplied by tens of billions of dollars, is tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So we're already facing $2 billion in debt service costs alone two years from now. Where is that going to go beyond the three-year plan? We, we don't know. Th those numbers start to get very frightening, and that's billions of dollars that is not being spent on programs. And the, that's what credit rating agencies look, look at, is our capacity to pay back our debt. Uh, and that creates a spiral, which is, is a huge problem, could very well be a huge problem for this province. And I repeat the question, what if we're wrong? What if this government's wrong? What if it's even worse? That's frightening. Right? And, and so I really encourage this government to think hard about that, about what the impact of that and the implications of that could be, not just for us in this generation, but for future generations. Honourable Member for Calgary Hayes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and uh, I was also interested in the uh, Honourable Member uh, talking about the, uh, the carbon tax and, and particularly the rebates and, and uh, what improvements that uh, he thinks that the government might be able to make to uh, the way that they have deter de determined and decided to, uh, to lay that plan out for Alberta families. I'm on the record as being in favour of a carbon tax, uh, and that's, we've done our own, uh, our own climate plan that includes a, a, a consumer-based carbon tax. Um, and the, the, the objective of a carbon tax is to make carbon more expensive. That should be the objective. It should not be just simply transfer wealth. And I think that uh, perhaps the lowest quarter, uh, lowest income quarter of Albertans uh, should be entitled to uh, a rebate. I think those people genuinely would suffer under the carbon tax. Um, but there sh I think the carbon tax should be paid by more Albertans. That may not be the most popular view, frankly, uh, or, uh, 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 amongst uh, Albertans. But if a carbon tax is set out to do what the government says it's supposed to do, which is actually reduce our carbon emissions, and by the way, we've had absolutely no meaningful estimates of what the carbon emission reduction will actually be, and we haven't seen any plan to tie together a climate strategy with important things like market access for our province. We haven't seen any progress on that file. 
then that Albertans are rightly wondering, what's the point of a carbon tax? Why are, why are we doing Is it just another cash grab from the government? And I think a carbon tax needs to be very clear, like our friends in BC do, lay out in the budget very specifically the incoming from the carbon tax and the associated cuts and direct investments in innovation that that money is being used for. So it's not just seen as a cash grab by government. And that's why Albertans are so concerned, especially at a very difficult time.